Okay, hello everyone. Um, can those people outside that want to come in, come in, please? That's it, move towards the door. I think we need to announce outside, Marco. Thanks everyone. Can, can you try and shepherd more people in? Yeah. Okay, well, as more people eventually come in, I'm going to get the ball rolling on this panel, and this is one that I'm, I'm really looking forward to. Um, just to say, in 15 minutes, the parallel panel will begin next door, but this is panel eight. The human dimension of security, human rights defenders' protection in Serbia. And online, we're going to be joined by Dunja Mijetovic, um, and here in person, we have Katarin Cech, we have Niels Mujniaks, we have Katarina Golobovic, and the moderator is Jovana Spremo. So thank you, everyone. Hello everyone, uh, welcome to the panel Human Dimension of Security in the Western Balkans uh, with the subtitle uh, Is there a protection for human rights defenders? Um, we have strived to tackle this issue for years and recently uh, we see the, the more and more need to actually um, address uh, the protection of those who are actually protecting uh, the public interest and fighting for for the rights of other for that of others uh, lasting security actually cannot be achieved without the respect for human rights and the democratic institutions and this is something uh, that is uh, so easily uh, so fragile and so easily um, ruined by by the governments especially uh, those who tend to be more autocratic, as the, as the title of the event uh, actually says. So what can we actually do in order to protect citizen security and to protect the security of those who uh, defend the citizens? Um, I'm very pleased to welcome my great panelists today. Uh, we have uh, Ms. Dunja Mijatovic online. Um, uh, the Council of Europe Commissioner for Human Rights, uh, who will uh, actually provide the um, uh, introduction to our panel, and then I will uh, speak more with my panelists um, on the issues on human rights protections and human rights defender protection. Ms. Dunja. Thank you. Thank you, Jovana. Greetings to all, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, friends, Special greeting to my friend Niels, who actually used to hold the torch of the office of the commissioner before I came to the office in 2018. Uh, it is a real pleasure uh, to address such a crucial uh, issue uh, as the security of human rights defenders and security in general in Serbia and beyond. I wish I'm there with you uh, in Belgrade, but unfortunately, uh, I could not uh, come in person. So we use the possibilities of uh, online uh, exchanges that are so important nowadays. I cannot emphasize uh, enough how important um, uh, it is to look at the importance of uh, the work human rights defenders are doing in our societies. Um, we also have to recognize uh, the, the work they are doing and also uh, to pressure those um, in power, if, if I can say so, to honor um, their obligations and hold them accountable. Uh, and, and I think the problem we have um, in the Western Balkans is still not enough understanding and recognition of the importance uh, of the work of human rights defenders um, um, for, for the societies in order for the societies to move forward, 
to be more liberal, modernized, and then at the same time ensure security. Because I don't think we, we can have um, real security and talk about safety of citizens if human rights defenders, and I would add here, of course, journalists, can do their job freely um, and also uh, uh, safely. Human rights defenders, uh, they contribute uh, to shaping uh, public discourse around human rights policies um, and help also ensure that human rights policies are compliant uh, with international standards. Uh, and there are in all ways indispensable uh, allies um, and natural partners uh, in my work as Commissioner uh, for human rights. It would be impossible to tackle issues I'm tackling in all Council of Europe uh, uh, member states if there is not, you know, uh, this recognition, this trust, and possibilities to share information and uh, address uh, issues of concern. Sometimes those issues are quite uh, technical, I would say, but most of the time those issues are sometimes, you know, life-saving. Um, and uh, are related to the grave uh, human rights uh, violations that are happening in, uh, unfortunately, too many Council of uh, uh, Europe member states. Support for their work, uh, their protection, and the promotion um, of an enabling uh, environment uh, uh, for their activities lie um, at the core of my mandate. Human rights defenders are even mentioned uh, in the mandate of the commissioner. Uh, and I'm also uh, determined to continue advocating uh, for this. I'm very much uh, alarmed uh, by the conditions in which human rights defenders operate both in Serbia uh, and in the region. Um, and I'm worried to see that they are constantly endangered and pressured. Um, what we see is reprisal from state, but also non-state uh, actors, uh, and that presents a huge problem. Um, and also the impunity uh, for crimes committed against them. They are also singled out, as you know, by some public uh, officials or uh, public figures or uh, media uh, outlets uh, as foreign agents, uh, traitors uh, or collaborators, all absurd and dangerous lies, I would say. I'm particularly concerned uh, by the increasing risks faced by human rights defenders who expose corruption and threats to environment, uh, those working on transitional justice, uh, and LGBTI activists. The arrest of uh, environmental activists in Novi Sad uh, for their work opposing uh, deforestation and planned construction of a bridge across the Danube, uh, three defamation lawsuits so so-called slaps submitted recently um, against two young environmental activists uh, in Bosnia and Herzegovina because of their public uh, campaign against the construction of hydropower uh, plants, death threats and smear campaigns uh, against the crime and corruption reporting network Krik in Serbia last year are only, only a few uh, dire illustrations of the problem. Nevertheless, I'm closely following uh, all of this. I consider human rights defenders key to help the region to come out of a difficult past and face the challenging present in a way which promotes social cohesion and dignity for all. If we are not ready to expose the problems, to discuss them, and to have possibilities to build bridges based on trust and truth, then I do not think uh, the region is moving in a right uh, direction. I just returned yesterday from Dublin, where I met um, many human rights defenders from different parts of the Council of Europe member states, including uh, human rights defenders from Russia and Belarus, listening to their struggle, to their fight in order to do their job, trying to promote human rights, trying to shield and to help the most vulnerable parts of the society, dealing with issues related to women's rights, LGBTI rights, children's rights, people with disabilities. So the people that are really marginalized and trying to really access their rights. I would add here Roma population, migrants, but there are many others. So, they told me about the struggle, 
the attempts by the governments east and west to silence them, to silence their critical voices, to make all possible obstacles to their work. Uh, and this is an issue I will continue following, uh, but also raising with Council of Europe member states at the earliest possible occasion. Uh, we cannot continue uh, holding, um, you know, societies and talking about human rights importance for um, the life um, and well-being uh, of people if the governments are simply neglecting um, obligations, resolutions that are voluntarily agreed upon when they became members of uh, Council of Europe, which we call the main human rights body in Europe. And at the same time, uh, human rights body, the main human rights body in Europe has member states that are imprisoning, torturing, uh, arresting uh, human rights defenders and journalists. Uh, and this has to stop. This needs to change. And in the post-pandemic world, uh, it is even more relevant uh, than ever before. So I'm really um, in aid of uh, the courage, uh, dedication, uh, and determination of human rights defenders. Um, I just met several from Ukraine uh, who are doing impossible work uh, under shelling. And I use this opportunity also to pay tribute to their extraordinary work. Uh, there are also many Russian human rights defenders and uh, ones from Belarus uh, constantly traveling and uh, doing their work uh, in a very difficult situation. I saw this with my own eyes when I visited Ukraine in May and spoke to them. So they're a source of motivation and they make me feel an additional responsibility uh, to try to do uh, together with my team uh, everything in order to support them and to exercise uh, my mandate in the fullest. So I can only say uh, that you can count on me to keep calling on the authorities uh, of member states to deliver on their duty to foster an environment in which defenders may uh, conduct their work safely, free from fear of threats, violence and reprisals. And I wish you a wonderful discussion. I will also stay uh, for a while in order to uh, listen to other uh, distinguished panelists and then also maybe uh, engage a bit later. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Mijatovic, and thank you for this uh, encouragement words. Uh, this is especially important for the region countries uh, when you usually have to go all the way around in order to pressure the government to provide the, the right uh, amount of protection, um, to, not only to human rights defenders, but to their citizens. So um, we have been discussing now for a, a day and a half uh, different kind of security issues. Uh, but um, uh, I would like to repeat something that um, Oleksandra Matvichuk uh, yesterday said, and that is that it all starts with the human security. So this is a starting point, and if we don't care about the human dimension of the security, it, is, it can easily go to uh, and become and, and to create other security issues within the region. So the governments are supposed to change, but what's not supposed to change is the level of protection that we are guaranteeing to, to the citizens. And um, uh, we have seen recently, not only in the region, but, but throughout the Europe, the further deterioration and the violations to freedom of assembly, freedom of uh, expression, even the, the freedom of um, association, and um, it has uh, struck the, the region of Western Balkans very, very hard in the last uh, few years. Um, especially these three freedoms are more and more um, limited and um, uh, endangered. So um, I would like to discuss uh, firstly with you um, uh, on what do you see as uh, the most uh, violated rights at this point um, in the region? And um, how can we actually uh, call for these mispractices of the government to stop at some point? Um, my, my first um, uh, panelist will be uh, Mr. Mujnieks, who is um, the director of Europe Regional Office of Amnesty International. Um, uh, Ms. Mijatovic already mentioned that you 
kept uh, her role in the previous mandate, so you are very experienced uh, in, um, in uh, monitoring, um, let's say, the situation of the human rights violations. Um, the recent um, amnesty report uh, actually tackled a lot of these issues, and I see that um, it's becoming more and more um, detailed on the issues that are tackling uh, the region, especially Serbia and Bosnia. So um, I would like to hear uh, your, um, uh, your current uh, thinking on, on uh, what can we do to um, increase the protection of the rights and what are the most endangered rights currently at the region. Well, thank you very much uh, for having me here. And it's such an honor to be on the same panel with my successor, Dunja, and with distinguished colleagues uh, from around the region. Um, at Amnesty International, we see the right to freedom of expression and the right to freedom of, of assembly as being very closely intertwined and linked. It's very difficult to organize a demonstration to mobilize people if you don't have freedom of the media, freedom of expression. Uh, and now increasingly, people are using their right to protest to demand and defend their rights. Um, this is why Amnesty is focusing on the right to protest um, as one of our key global priorities. And we see it's very topical in this region as well. I think the issue of, one of the issues of greatest concern to me in this region is the attempts by politicians, uh, influential business people, to silence criticism, especially by using slap suits. Um, Dunya already mentioned, mentioned this, uh, the use of defamation and, slap, and defamation laws and slap suits was already widespread in the region a few years ago, but I think we've seen an explosion um, in recent times here. Uh, she mentioned several of the cases uh, that Amnesty is also involved in. Um, in Kosovo, we, we defended environmental activists against a slap suit from, a, uh, from an Austrian energy company in uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina. We're now assisting um, these same environmental activists that, that Dunja mentioned. Uh, she mentioned uh, Krik um, in, in Serbia and in Slovenia, one media outlet has you know, 39 uh, slap suits against it, which is, which is quite amazing that uh, activists and journalists have to spend all of their time fighting off lawsuits, spending money, spending time in courts uh, just, to do their, just to do their job. So we see this as being a, a crucial threat uh, to democracy, to human rights in the region, and we see these freedoms as being very closely linked. And this is why we intend to engage on this issue uh, going forward quite, quite actively. This and the right to protest, I think, are two of the biggest issues that we're going to be looking at uh, in the coming months and years. Perfect. When, when we speak of protests, uh, I will turn to Ms. Czech. You are a member of um, European Parliament and actually a member of Subcommittee on, on Human Rights. And uh, we recently had actually uh, large protests in, uh, in your country, in, in Hungary. So um, I would like to, to hear more from you. Um, how, do you um, how do you see this, this recent trend? And um, uh, does, does the problems that uh, uh, citizens are facing in, in Western Balkans are actually differ from other uh, parts of Europe that you uh, are monitoring when preparing the, the resolutions in the European Parliament? Well, first of all, I would also like to thank uh, you for the invitation and for the possibility to be here with you in beautiful Belgrade and uh, to discuss on this absolutely crucial topic. Because as you mentioned, there is a trend. Uh, there is a trend that has been going on for years, the trend of democratic backsliding, the trend of rolling back freedoms, uh, the trend of growing authoritarianism uh, with all the challenges and difficulties it poses for everybody who stands up for human rights, for the freedom of expression, for the rights of minorities. And this trend is uh, not only present in the Western Balkans, not only present uh, in some specific member states of the European Union that we often talk about, but I believe this is a global trend. And we are not paying enough attention to this, and our tools and mechanisms are still not there to match this challenge. And Another part of the trend is uh, the similar patterns that tend to appear over and over again, not only in neighboring countries, but also in countries that are geographically a bit fa farther away, like in the United States, or in Israel, or uh, in this 
region or uh, in Hungary, in Poland, the, the slap seats that were just mentioned, or the establishment of uh, government sponsored NGOs that are diluting uh, the, the, the public space and the taking away possibilities for uh, those picking up who are really standing up for good causes, or the increasing trend I have to say directly from Vladimir Putin's playbook to la uh, label NGOs as foreign agents or uh, to try to uh, make it more difficult for them to access funding, to access uh, legal remedies. These are trends that authoritarians are learning from each other. And I have to say that under the watchful eye of the European Union and the international community. So uh, what I would like to really stress is that we in the EU, we have to do much more to defend human rights. Uh, also with funding, also with direct channels uh, for access to justice for them. Uh, but I, I, I also believe that we just have to be much more vocal. And in a, particularly in a region where the accession of the EU is, of course, a strategic principle that we all share. Human rights have to be put on the table much more, much more intensively. There should not be any dialogue. Mr. Varhey uh, engages with the leaders of Western Balkan countries without pointing out on the specific instances that are very, very clearly illustrated. And I'm afraid that he is not doing uh, an appropriate job here. And this is really a problem. And Another uh, closing thought here, we also have to uh, put our house in order inside the EU because the, we can only be a credible actor for human rights and democracy outside the EU and in the countries uh, which uh, we, uh, we would like to engage with more closely if we put our own house in order and if we do not uh, stand idly by when European Union member states are uh, projecting the very similar signs of democratic backsliding that uh, we are supposedly fighting against uh, outside the EU. So the instruments have to be updated, uh, also the financial instruments, and I'm very happy to announce that we are working in the European Parliament on the update of the uh, guidelines for human rights defenders, so I'm also very much looking for inputs on uh, how we could be an even stronger and an even more forceful actor for the protection of, uh, f of, of the global good. Okay, this is a good news that uh, it, it's actually becoming a topic. We recently actually saw the, the um, European Commission uh, reports on the region, so um, the novelty in the Serbia's report is that the, these freedoms actually gain much more space than they were getting for, for previous several years. So freedom of assembly, uh, of course, due to the bans of Europe Pride, got uh, a pretty much detailed description of uh, what the government is not doing well. Um, and the human rights defenders and civil society is being more and more mentioned uh, in the context of the need of protection. And um, uh, my final panelist is uh, uh, Ms. Katarina Golubovic, President of Lawyers Committee for Human Rights um, and a member of JCC. So um, I would like, um, since UCOM is basically providing free legal aid, so you get in, in touch with the uh, people on daily level, uh, and their human rights um, uh, violation and issues. Do you see, uh, given the certain the, the current uh, situation uh, with security and the uh, and the level that the current conflict is affecting the, the Western Balkans, do you see the difference uh, in the in the level of um, violation of human rights? Is there any kind of connection? And uh, what are the rights that are most endangered in Serbia? Uh, and are there mechanisms to protect them? Mm, thank you. Thank you for uh, a lot of questions. <laughs> um, I, I, I must say that uh, I think that the, the, these endangered right, rights are actually a result of weak institutions, dem weak democratic institutions. So in time of crisis, uh, the weak institutions actually uh, want to hear the messages, the messages from the political figures. So we don't have the protection and we don't have the process of protection of human rights. And that's why we have, you know, uh, these kind of riots, of protests, because people do not believe anymore in the institutional protection. So that's why we speak now about protest and that's why we speak about the breach of freedom of assembly. So everything is 
interconnected, yeah? So uh, when, when we speak about crisis, we actually um, uh, uh, see that the protection of human rights actually um, is, how to say, the, the answer on, on, on political messages. So uh, when you don't have a clear message, you can see this. For example, when the um, Russian aggression started, uh, we had the anti-war peaceful protests, so peaceful standing in the Belgrade city center, so we were in the pedestrian zone, and it was processed by the police. Why? Because we didn't have a clear message from Serbia. Is this, is this a good message? for our international relations or not. So this was the first time that you see the institutions, Ministry of Interior, that actually start to process peaceful, peaceful protests of 30 people in the street. So this is how the crisis actually um, impact on human rights protection. So. Uh, I just want to also say that uh, regarding the protection, as you mentioned, uh, we have to rely on human rights defenders. Why? Uh, because human rights defenders can bring international standards and values to our courts, our national uh, um, protector of rights. Yes, we rely on uh, protection of uh, uh, international community, and, but we also need the protection in our, um, our countries. So if we are um, so loud, as the other panelists said, we can uh, make some difference and we can actually pull our courts to protect freedom of assembly or freedom of information. Uh, we have also a lot of slabs here in uh, Serbia these days, uh, but if we see these process uh, through angle of values, we will see that we can, you know, have the protective mechanism from our courts, but the problems, problems are actually values, and that is uh, why the human rights defenders had the big, big role in, in making uh, one, one society democratic ones. Um, I want to um, tackle this issue of protection uh, by the international community. So, um, if we, uh, of, of course, we can see different isolated incidents, uh, we can say that human rights defenders are endangered here and there, they are pressured or similar, but um, no one is actually stressing the importance of reporting on these issues. So uh, in preparing the, uh, the report of, the, of Amnesty, um, how, who are you relying on? Like, what are the sources that you actually um, uh, need in the region in order to provide, to, in order to get the right information so that you can tackle it in the report and then we know that uh, only this pressure that comes from the outside can actually make, maybe make a, a difference uh, when it comes to the region. Yeah, amnesty reports are an interesting beast because they're not reports for the sake of reports. Every report that amnesty produces is meant to be campaignable. Uh, in order, it's supposed to be used to campaign on behalf of, of human rights change and it's also to be used for advocacy work at European institutions at UN level and so on. Uh, we don't have a, a large presence in this region. The only country in the region that has a, a, a national section is Slovenia. Mm -hmm. um, but there's a lot of interest in European sections to become more active here. Um, by AI Italy, by AI Austria, by AI Netherlands, um, um, and, by, and by others. So we hope to scale up our work here. Um, the way that uh, our researchers usually work is um, Amnesty research focuses on victims and the testimony of victims. Um, and the interview process is quite rigorous. Uh, I recently witnessed it for the first time because I came on board relatively recently. Um, and uh, gathering the testimony of, vic of, of victims of human rights violations is an absolute kind of core of the whole process. Uh, and of course, 
we rely very much on local actors where we don't have national sections, we rely on local actors, on journalists, on uh, human rights defenders, on NGOs, um, and we try to, to understand the landscape, but to amplify the voices of people on the ground and to amplify the voices of victims. This is, this is a core approach. Um, and, and of course, we are only happy, we're only too happy when, when others, when, when media pick up on our reports and, and steal from us, uh, <laughs> when uh, the findings of our reports are reflected in the work of international organizations, because that has a, a multiplier effect. Um, so this is, this is a key, to give voice to the victims of, of human rights violations. That's our, uh, that's our primary goal. Perfect. And um, um, European Parliament is also reporting on, on different uh, issues, but including uh, on human rights defenders. So um, how, how does your system function? So where, where do you uh, find the information um, that you can actually state in the reports? And um, how do you further use, do you have any kind of um, follow-up um, um, after your reports? Because they are, when they are out, they are for everyone, uh, but we never have this um, feedback from the governments, let's say, uh, that will tackle the issues that the parliament, uh, as a, let's say, only people, institutions in the EU uh, can tackle. I believe that the European Parliament has an extremely important role in global human rights advocacy because we are a body uh, which is, I think, one of the bravest parliaments in the world when trying to put out, out issues on the agenda that uh, very often nobody else touches. And for this, it's absolutely instrumental, of course, that our uh, European Parliament Secretariat, but also our MEP offices are regularly in touch with human rights defenders, uh, but also with uh, global organizations like Amnesty, for instance, uh, for getting the best sources of what's happening on the ground. I think our reports are, are um, quite good quality. Of course, it could also be improved, but the real question here is, is indeed the enforcement, like what mm -hmm. happens afterwards. And here, I would really welcome a closer cooperation from the Commission, for instance, because we can write all the nice and beautiful reports on human rights defenders or violations of rights as we wish, but if there is like any type of discussion on trade, on accession, on... Um, any other bilateral or multilateral issues, I think the Commission has to be obliged to put human rights issues to the top of the agenda. And, and, and we also uh, should uh, improve our instruments, uh, our trade deals, for instance, or our due diligence laws uh, to cover more ground. So, so the impact of the EU could also grow larger. Because let's face it, right now, also the war of aggression in our neighborhood is, is, is a war between democracies and autocracies. And, it, and if the EU really wants to be a global player, as I believe we should, we have to be a player that has democracy and the protection of rights at the center of its agenda. So I hope that there will be an even closer cooperation between Parliament and the relevant bodies, and I'm very much welcoming the very good efforts of those who are uh, already following suit, but there should be much more improvement, and particularly on one side, on uh, enforcement. Because the legal framework is very often there. Yeah. You probably know more about that. Uh, during the accession talks, for instance, there were a lot of changes made. It's there on paper, and then it's not getting implemented. And the Commission has to be extremely vocal here. I don't want papers. I want results. I want real protection for people, and if it is not happening, then we have a problem, which so we shouldn't be having problems. Thank you. I, I would like to um, ask uh, uh, Ms. Miatovic uh, if you can uh, provide us with uh, more information on the feedback from the countries when you are uh, stating uh, uh, a cert that there are certain issues and violation of human rights, especially when, when they tackle uh, human rights defenders um, as such. Yeah, there are so many uh, extremely important issues um, that uh, all of you uh, already raised. Um, I think, you know, the, the, the issue of, of, of feedback or a response uh, from, from the government is uh, extremely important, particularly when it comes to country reports or letters uh, that I sent uh, in relation to uh, certain uh, human rights uh, violations. At the same time, what I have to say, uh, if we talk about accession process, if we talk about 
um, candidate and potential candidate countries uh, uh, to the EU. I think, and this is what I raised publicly, but also in my uh, talks with uh, different commissioners, um, Parliament is quite different, European Parliament. Uh, they are much stronger uh, uh, with their, what Catalina was saying, much stronger uh, uh, views and much stronger language that is used uh, addressing uh, Balkan leaders. And here I can also take off my uh, commissioner's hat and talk as a, as a person from the region, uh, somebody who do understand a bit more on how you need to address certain issues. Uh, I think the problem is that uh, the issues related to human rights are not uh, discussed in a, in a way that they should, you know, that they are not exposed uh, as much as I would like to see. Um, the language is more technical in the progress report. You have many summits um, on the Western Balkan and, uh, you know, you, you, you see talks about technical issues. Um, a need to improve freedom of the media, freedom of assembly. It is repeating year by year, but not actual sort of push in uh, to doing something that is really important to change situation that is very problematic. Um, some states do respond with uh, certain changes. It depends really on the of the leaders uh, uh, if they are genuinely uh, willing to 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 engage. Uh, or, uh, you know, it happens also that uh, almost every other day I'm persona non grata in one of the member states because uh, uh, the government or, or uh, you know, the authorities that I'm addressing simply do not want to engage uh, and are simply, you know, flatly denying uh, allegations uh, in relation to, to, to human rights, which I think is very problematic because we all um, you know, coming from international organizations or, uh, you know, global NGOs like Amnesty, Human Rights Watch, uh, people are working hard in order to check, double check, triple check the information they receive. They engage with governments, they ask for uh, changes, but then at the end, you know, it is quite frustrating to see that there is not much going on. What was also raised by Catalina, and I think it's very important, is that the European Union member states should lead by example. For many decades, uh, EU was a safe oasis when it comes to work of human rights defenders uh, and journalists, not any longer, not after uh, Daphne's murder, not after uh, murder of Jan Kuciak and his fiancée, Lara McKee, Northern Ireland, and many other cases that are actually proving that much more needs to be done in order to change uh, a very problematic uh, situation. I'm really glad to hear what Neil said, that Amnesty is uh, increasing their attention and presence, because I think it's needed. Uh, there is a need to see more recognition uh, and more support uh, for human rights defenders uh, in the region. And they are great people, courageous people, um, working in a very difficult situation, but at the same time, somehow, I feel they are, not, they are neglected um, in those uh, very important political talks, apart from really having just meetings in order to, to, to show, yes, we do meet the civil society. Um, and then uh, at the end, we have this wonderful words on paper, um, agreements um, and uh, acceptance of certain things that needs to be changed, but in practice and uh, when we travel to the field, the situation is quite different and it is very problematic. Thank you. Um, I will turn now to Katarina. Uh, three years ago, um, you started uh, officially monitoring the situation with human rights defenders uh, within the network of uh, Solidarity for the Rights of All. Uh, what, are the, uh, what are the results of this monitoring? And um, uh, how do you reach uh, local uh, human rights defenders? And, and uh, uh, has this da data that is collected actually changed anything when it comes to the reaction in, uh, and the increasing of protection of human rights defenders? Yeah, so uh, uh, our task is actually, uh, was to make the problems of human rights defenders in Serbia uh, recognize, uh, recognize the, on the international level. So, as I said, that if we have the protection of international community, we are protected. And uh, the map of incident was 
a tool to present um, to international community the problems of human rights defenders. We succeeded to collect all relevant data because we actually defend human rights defenders and they talked with us about real, problem, uh, real problems on the local level. Uh, we are there for them because, for, because they do not believe in, for example, um, the attorneys at law that lives there and uh, often the attorneys at law are in connection with the uh, local officials who are actually jeopardize their rights. So uh, that's why we, uh, our existence is uh, very important uh, for, for their protection. So they uh, called us, we protected them uh, on the court, at the court, and also they called us to, uh, just to inform us uh, about some pressures uh, because they, they done something or they just uh, criticized some, some uh, problems in their uh, local level, in uh, environmental uh, uh, spheres or, or Etc. Etc. So the problems are really different, but uh, the pressures are the same. So we have the pressure on uh, freedom of uh, expression. We have a lot of uh, slap suits uh, in some municipalities, and um, we actually see that the court uh, um, change they, they, their their views about the level of protection that human rights defenders should have. And everything is presented on the map. So we don't have just the incidents, we have also the answers of, of our institutions, the answers of media, uh, the answers of public officials, but also the answers of international com community. Now, uh, as Dunja Mijatovic said, we have to have not just the legal analysis of the position of human rights defenders in um, our progress report, but also we have to have the data about the attacks and what are the problems. So we actually made it to put this uh, map of incidents and data from, from uh, the map in the progress report. And now, uh, actually, we, uh, we have the good base to track uh, the, um, to track the, 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 the uh, improvement of the position of human rights defenders. So I think that this map is, is very is a um, very valuable tool, uh, not just for us. I think that uh, we should uh, um, share this map to uh, all human rights defenders in the region because it also relies on similar maps uh, that, uh, that are developed in, in the international level and European uh, Union level. Okay, so I, I will stop now for, for a moment to uh, see whether there are uh, any questions at this point from the audience. Do we have a mic? Thank you. It's working. I'm Milo Santic, and I will address these three questions as a human rights defender, as a president of the governing board of the Independent Journalist Association of Vojvodina. Uh, I, uh, human rights defenders are rarely working individually, usually working in some organizations or groups or movements. So I want to address these questions from that angle. Uh, regarding European issues, we heard that there, are some, there will be some changes in financial instruments and that there will be some changes in guidelines. Uh, regarding the financial instruments, we had that uh, news or, or actually info in the January 20 this year that 700 million euros were not spent really well for the rule of law. So uh, are there any intentions to give a little bit more money to the civic sector and not to give it all to the states? That's one question regarding IPA. Uh, and I can deepen that regarding financial instruments, but that's enough for now. And regarding the guidelines, we have experiences in the last couple of years where we are approaching delegations in the region to support 
non-financially, uh, human rights defenders, mm -hmm. uh, meetings, organizations, or whatever. And the first and the only question is, is that EU financed project? If not, well, I don't know. So are those guidelines going to change something? Because you announced some changes. And the third question for Ms. Golubovic is actually, uh, were you approaching, you are usually approaching these individual cases and cases of attacks. Are you thinking about approaching these organizational needs or group needs also regarding protection of human rights defenders? Thank you. Will you start? Yes, sure. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for your questions and I would actually love to stay in touch with you uh, to get a bit more uh, into the guidelines from your perspective, uh, just as a pretext. Uh, but yes, regarding the guidelines, the problem that you mentioned is, is, is very prevalent and this is something that we should tackle. So the EU has guidelines and they are all recommendations or suggestions or like a framework. There is not really an obligation for the delegations to keep it. So we see delegations who are, you know, more adhering to uh, the spirit of the guidelines and others are a bit more selective here. It also, of course, depends on uh, who is the leader there, uh, where what like other, um, other things are in play. I, I, I think that, of course, our, all of our delegations are trying to do a good job, but uh, there is, let's say, a fluctuation or of uh, of uh, importance of the human rights issue. Uh, and I, I, I believe that we have to have guidelines that are binding, or at least like a stronger guidance uh, for making a, a uniform position, no matter uh, where you are in the globe. If you go into an EU delegation, you should have the same level of dedication and the same level of service. And for what, what I also believe it's a big problem is that in, in, in a lot of uh, EU delegations, and I'm not sure about Serbia, so I don't know how it is here, but it is, also not really clear that who is the person responsible for human rights. Uh, you go on the website and you see like a lot of email address, but there is not really an explanation of you know, who does what. Uh, so there has to be, I believe, a specific person at every delegation who is the contact point for human rights defenders, whose uh, task would center at uh, helping you also non-financially uh, with those types of uh, efforts. Because let's face it, if you have such a need where else to go but to the EU delegation? We should be there to help you. Uh, and I, I think we have to be much more flexible. So thank you for this feedback. And uh, I, uh, I'm sure I will try to take it forward as much as possible. Regarding the, the financing, um, well, just like a minute going back to the trends that you mentioned. Actually, I'm from Hungary, so EU member state. And we are having the same advocacy campaign for uh, the European cohesion funds to be sent directly to the civil sector and not through the government. So the authoritarian back backsliding has an effect on similar purposes and different in instruments. So I certainly hope that there will be a, a movement here as well. What I uh, would like to point out uh, is there was a new, uh, a new, new instrument uh, called the NDICI established that is separated from the IPA and uh, it, 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 it provides a, a much more... Uh, Mm, flexible leave uh, for, for human rights causes, uh, but there is certainly space for improvement and I think that the Human Rights Committee has to be more vocal in the financial design of uh, the budget and also other new instruments because we should really spend this money for the benefit of the cause with as little bureaucracy as possible as directly for those who are on the ground as possible. So this is my dedication and I will, would like, really like to be there for you to help you. So the, the, the second question was uh, about uh, uh, non-financial support. So who would you, okay, but who would you like to answer? <laughs> Will you? Okay. Regarding non-financial support, it is the crucial one, I, I, I think, yeah. uh, especially when we have, you know, the, the problems with, with uh, um, the specific problems. Uh, you, you can, uh, remember the situation when Anna was arrested and when Dunja Mijatovic actually said that it was unlawful, etc. So this kind of intervention 
and uh, also can prevent, not just solve the problem. I think that the, uh, the, the role of um, international organizations and the protection mechanisms are, are crucial for pre prevention of escalation of of violence. For example, um, now I think that is the, the uh, good momentum to actually prevent the escalation of violation in, in uh, Novi Sad. So this kind of support we really, really need. Um, the second question was also for me personally. Uh, so uh, Lawyers Committee for Human Rights, but, uh, but not just we, we are together with also um, Belgrade uh, sec uh, Security um, Center. Center, sorry, and uh, also on, uh, public parliament from Leskovac. So we don't reach to people. People are reaching us, no, and not just people, also the organization. Yesterday, I uh, got a phone call from one organization from Leskovac because the attack was announced uh, from the uh, police. Uh, some inspectors uh, of uh, commercial crime asked for them just to come. Uh, today and to present all statutes, all um, agreements on donation, etc., etc. So they had just called, come to uh, tomorrow and and bring me everything. So and uh, that was the answer on the attack of them towards uh, one, how to say, Gongos NGO on the local uh, level, and um, uh, their security was jeopardized for a long, long time uh, this, this um, summer. So we didn't have any reaction from the prosecution regarding the attacks on, on them, and this is very prominent organization that I think is established in 1990s. So uh, we, we talk about women in peace, and people from my organization do, do not know the, the details because, you know, uh, it is the newest, newest attack. And, um, and you have, you know, the answers when, when someone who, uh, who is credi uh, whose credibility is, you know, um, uh, sorry. <laughs> Uh, suspicious, 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 suspicious. So you have uh, the, uh, the uh, prosecution is reacting. So this kind of, um, of attacks we are dealing with and not just we are defending, but also we want to prove that we are uh, on the right side and if we want, we also will use the legal means to attack those one who attacked us. Uh, Will you, you, want to, you wanted to add on the uh, non-financial support something? Yes, just a very brief uh, remark that I think it's problematic if people are turned away uh, if the project is not an EU finance project. And I, I do think that the responsibility should be universal. So I, I, I think the guidelines have to be more flexible here, as it is a matter of life and death uh, in, in, in some instances. And, and publicity really saves lives. I, I really see that. Uh, if we make a statement, if we make like a press release or a resolution, and there are people specifically named that, I don't know, they are jailed unjustly or they are under threat, very often this is the lifeline that they get for getting their safety back. So uh, if we can play a role as the EU, apart from financing, it's here. Just to, to use this like very big microphone that our voters gave to our hand, uh, is the, the, the best use for this is, is really to speak very loudly through to power and advocate for those who are fighting the, the hardest fight. So. We have to make space for, space for that, for sure. Yeah, thank you. Do we have more questions? Uh, hello. It's on, it's on. Oh, thank you. Hello. Uh, I have no question. I have a comment to add, if you allow. Uh, well, uh, I think that there is, uh, that, uh, there is an even big problem, bigger problem. Uh, the problem is uh, uh, 
uh, a problem, uh, the problem is uh, in uh, the hum dehumanization of human rights. It's uh, uh, when uh, corporations uh, have all rights which uh, uh, they are entitled, but uh, they are, done, are not, they are not responsible for the, viol for, for, for the violation of human rights. And uh, I think that there is no, uh, there, that the uh, prohibition of torture and the uh, inhuman and degrading treatment is more uh, violated, more and more violated, especially in, uh, in a Staritsa case, where people are being detained and tortured. So I think that uh, Council of Europe has to uh, work on the convention treating the human rights violation by the, uh, by the corporations because uh, because you know because uh, I think that uh, uh, states will continue uh, to be responsible only by Dr. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you for the comment. Your, your business is somehow uh, becoming a, a, a new problem when it comes to um, human rights violation. Uh, we have several cases in Serbia. Uh, when it comes to different uh, foreign investments, and, and I think uh, it was it needs to be tackled more in, in future. But uh, uh, thank you for the comment. Uh, I would like to to um, give you the the last set of um, questions. Uh, but uh, I would like to hear a view from all of you. Uh, we heard that the institutions are not very um, eager to to defend human rights defenders, the, the national ones, the regional ones. Um, the only protections that we get is via international community, let's say. So uh, what can human rights defenders do in order to ensure the security of, the, of, of themselves? So um, uh, how can they protect themselves in order to protect those who, whom they defend? And I, I would like to, to have a, a tour of the table, <laughs> let's say. Niels, will you start? Yes, yeah, sure. Well, I think, first of all, human rights defenders have to seek coalitions with others because um, very often repressive governments use divide and rule tactics and try to pick out certain, certain bad NGOs and to mm -hmm. cult cultivate relations with others. So that the issue of solidarity among human rights NGOs and cooperation is absolutely critical, I think. This is what we do a lot of solidarity actions because it's, it's very tough to continue fighting if you think you're alone. Uh, if you think you're alone in your country, if you think you're alone internationally. Um, I think the other is to, to touch base again uh, with the base, to not get too divorced uh, from your rank and file members, from the public, and this is a big danger. Uh, we're very aware of this because we rely, we're a membership-based organization. We rely very much on relations with our, with our, with our constituencies, with our audiences. Um, third is to be as smart as the corporations and the governments trying to repress us. And this means, uh, especially in this day and age, it means being conversant and knowledgeable about the use of high tech to repress human rights. Um, we're, we're lucky in Amnesty, we have a, a specialized branch called Amnesty Tech, and we're actually intervening in a case in the Serbian Constitutional Court with some um, other NGOs here against uh, the new, uh, on a case involving the, the law and social cards, mm -hmm. using algorithmic discrimination uh, uh, by the government and so on. And this knowledge of how tech works, I think, is becoming increasingly important, especially when you have the use of facial recognition technology is when you have uh, kind of this concept of safe cities uh, coming in. So I think that's incredibly important. And finally, I think the knowledge of how to make the European institutions work for you, how to make the European Union, the Council of Europe, the OSCE, the UN, how to make these mechanisms work, how to communicate with them, how to use their findings, how to implicate them uh, so that they become allies uh, at the local level for human rights struggles. And this is, uh, it's tough because the Council of Europe and the, and the EU are very complicated mechanisms. Uh, but I think it's absolutely essential. It is, a, it is a, one of the best developed systems in the world, but we have to make it work. We have to make it work for us. And human rights defenders are absolutely critical in making this system work for the benefit of everybody. Thank you. We are writing everything down. <laughs> 
Dunja? Just briefly, uh, I think Niels already raised uh, all the important issues, you know, from uh, uh, solidarity, which I think is important, uh, crucially important. Um, and, and, and I will use the example. I was in uh, September, you know, I came to, to Belgrade in order to be with human rights defenders for Europe Right um, and to work with them um, and to make sure that uh, uh, everything goes smoothly. Um, at the same time, you know, I was uh, talking to uh, the high level officials, but I was working there uh, with human rights defenders, uh, constantly uh, trying to see what are the problems. But what I, what I missed uh, is actually more solidarity from other NGOs um, and civil society uh, organizations in Serbia uh, that were willing to come also to help the ones that are fighting for LGBTI rights. And this is just one example. In most of the cases, they stay in their bubble, defending only you know, one group of people. So this kind of solidarity, I think, is becoming even more uh, crucial nowadays. Then digital security, of course, uh, is absolutely um, essential. And I would add to this psychosocial support. People working in a difficult uh, environment, helping migrants in the forests, at the borders, uh, at the seas, uh, seeing uh, people being killed constantly dying in the uh, Mediterranean and at the borders uh, of, of, of Europe are particularly vulnerable. Uh, and this is just you know, one example. Um, this is an issue uh, that needs to be taken into account. Currently, human rights defenders working in Ukraine, they need more support. Uh, again, psychosocial, but also solidarity from others uh, that would join their forces and their voices when it's difficult and dark time. And we are going through one, and I do not think we should simply just neglect this uh, uh, and live in our own uh, comfort zone. So even more solidarity from human rights defenders can also uh, uh, bridge some uh, difficult situations and uh, expose the importance of their work across the borders uh, than not only on, on, on the national level. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Kathleen? I have a hard time answering this question because I don't want to tell you what to do because you know it better than, than I do, probably. I, I can only say that I have all the respect for you for, do what you, for doing what you are doing in, in sometimes extremely difficult environments. And I can only salute you for your stance for LGBTI rights, for women's rights, for uh, rights of journalists, for freedom of information, uh, for the fight against corruption, even in cases when your physical safety is in danger. So what I can only advise you is to reach out to us, to European authorities, uh, to, EU, uh, to UN authorities, and be pushy. We are, might be a bit difficult, we might be a bit bureaucratic, but we really want to hear your voice, and we want to be here for you, and we can only do good policy if we uh, are supported by strong voices from the ground. Uh, we need your knowledge and also your reports, so uh, please, let us know what's going on, and also the delegations, uh, let they know what's going on, because really our job should be is to, 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 to assist you in your fight that we respect so much. And without a strong and democratic Western Balkans, the entire safety and security of the whole European project is in danger. So we need to work together for this. And we in the European Parliament and in the Renew Europe group, where I'm a vice chair of, uh, we really, uh, want to be there for you to support your fight uh, in, in whatever instruments we have and we want to use the publicity available for us to, to help your cause. So just a very big thank you and uh, a huge, huge, huge respect from my side here. Thank you, Kathleen. And so, Katarina from the field. <laughs> <laughs> At the national level, I think that the most important thing is to actually explain to the citizens how important uh, is our work, uh, the work of human rights defenders. 
And when you have a weak institutions, then you have to have the trust of the citizens in your country. So I think that we have to be in synergy with uh, media and journalists and to actually explain to our citizens how important it is to have the free uh, human rights defenders to actually speak um, about public interest in their, their country. And when citizens trust you, then you are safe. Thank you. So uh, we are coming to uh, an end here. Uh, I don't know if we answer the question, is there a protection for human rights defenders? Uh, but I think we gain uh, a lot of uh, advice on how we can move on from, from here and uh, we stress the importance of uh, monitoring and reporting um, the, the, the problems uh, in our countries, especially Western Balkans countries which uh, strive to become EU members very soon but somehow uh, getting more and more um, far from the EU values. We uh, very hope that uh, we will stay on the right track and uh, provide more, uh, more sources and provide more um, strength to um, upkeeping the human dimension of security of the citizens of Western Balkans and the human rights prote protectors. Thank you. Much. Uh, so now we have lunch for an hour, which is just outside. Thank you all. See you here in an hour.